I'm Joe Trapalski. Welcome back to the Comark TV channel on YouTube. 2022 marks the 50th anniversary for Comark in the broadcast industry. So for this video, and perhaps the next few videos, I thought it would be cool to sit down with our former president and CEO, Dick Fiore, to get his historical perspective of RF in New England and throw in some history of Comark as well. Dick, your dad, Richard E. Fiore Sr., started Comark back in 1972. How did he get into the broadcast industry? You know, after World War II, my father served uh, in the Navy. He was stationed in Philadelphia uh, at the Naval Base. And he went to school under the GI Bill at Drexel Institute of Technology. Once he graduated from college, he took a job working for RCA um, in the radar division, where he met a gentleman by the name of Tom Yanks, who eventually was the general manager for Harris Broadcasting. Uh, Tom and my father were pretty good friends. In fact, he stops by at almost every NAV and says hi. Uh, but Tom and my father worked for the radar division, and that was uh, associated with you know, pretty much the same frequencies as UHF television. And um, he was a good engineer. They worked a lot with a company that had just started up in Raymond, Maine, called Dielectric Products. Uh, Doc Brown had started that company and uh, they worked a lot because they did not only military but also broadcast transmission products. Uh, they worked a lot together and developed a friendship. So when my father had gotten his master's degree from Drexel Institute, uh, there was a fallout between him and RCA and he took a job with uh, Doc Brown at, uh, in Raymond, Maine. Working mostly with RCA, <laughs> Uh, being a principal engineer and a design engineer for military applications and scientific products. Uh, he worked for a gentleman by the name of, uh, well, obviously Doc Brown was in charge of dielectric, but there were a number of interesting RF people that worked for dielectric at the time when my father went up there. Um, the lead engineer, the director of engineering for dielectric at that time, was a gentleman by the name of Ed Shively, and Ed eventually left and started Shively Labs uh, in Bridgeton, Maine. Bridgeton, Maine. There were also on the team Tom Vaughn, who left to start MCI, uh, Dwight Starbird, who left to start uh, MTI, uh, my father, who was transferred down to Acton, Massachusetts, and we'll get to that in just a second, Jack Kruger, who left and started SWR, uh, Joe Dunneman was actually on the team, I believe, at that particular point, although he may have been working for more in antennas. But there were a number of engineers that were in that group that formulated and spread out to really infiltrate uh, the RF, the RF uh, components parts for transmission and military applications throughout the Northeast. And that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of uh, broadcast engineering talent up in this or were a lot of reasons for broadcast engineering talent up in this particular area. So that was the start of it. Started in 1972. I think it's important to note that uh, my father had left Dielectric to start his first company, ERL, Electric Magnetic Radiation Labs. And sometime during the six, 1960s, uh, Ampex, a big company that really was specialized in designing studios, tapes, tape machines, and were involved in studio acquisition, capture, editing, those kind of things, um, knew that or felt like they needed to be able to supply to television stations a complete turnkey system. That's what RCA did. RCA had the studio products, they also had the transmission products, and Ampex lacked the transmission products. So they went about doing a study as to what they needed to acquire, and of interest was a company called Townsend Associates in Westfield, Massachusetts. George Townsend had left a WWLP, Channel 22 in Springfield, which was one of the first UHF television stations, I believe, on the air. I think they started in March of 1953. So it was early on usage of UHF because back then TV sets didn't even have UHF tuners. 
So, and if you remember the old UHF tuners, you had that, it's a tiny little dial that you tune. Anyway, I go back in history, sorry about that. Uh, well, George had started Townsend Associates over in, 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 in Agua, Massachusetts, and they caught the interest of Ampex. Um, George was also doing business at that time with my father's company, ERL, in, which was located out by Boston in Acton, Massachusetts. The other acquisition that Ampex had sort of targeted was a company called Bogner Antennas, which was within, located, I believe, in Westbury, Long Island. Uh, and they acquired all three of those organizations and brought them up to Westfield, Massachusetts. That was in 1968-69 timeframe. That was when I remember moving out to this particular area. I only lived here for one year before I went away to college, but I was here for a year. Uh, my father's company, my father worked for Ampex, George Townsend worked for Ampex, everybody worked for Ampex, but Ampex ran into financial troubles in 1970-71. 1972, my father left Ampex. I believe all of the designs of the transmitter systems that Ampex had had, formerly Townsend Associates, was sold to a company called CCA Electronics. And CCA Electronics set up a business out on Buck Pond Road in Westfield, Massachusetts, building television transmitter systems. That was headed up by, uh, I believe, Joe Donovan and Leroy Wallace. Leroy had come into the picture. My father started Comark Industries, which again was just RF components and products, and that was basically building diplexers, filters, couplers, coaxial transmission line. A few years after I graduated from college, 1976, he had a falling out with his business partner. The company had pretty much gone into bankruptcy, and my father had asked me, this was a year or so, year and a half after I graduated from college, if I wanted to come work for him. At the time, I said yes. I had no real obligation, so I, I thought it'd be interesting. Um, I graduated from North Adams State College with a degree in business administration. I didn't know what I was getting into, but I figured it could be interesting. Uh, if you told me that I could work for my father for, I don't know, 20 some odd years, I'd tell you that that'd be a really tough thing to do, but it was, it was as I look back, those were great years. Uh, anyway, my father started Comark Industries again, 1976. He hired, uh, amongst others, myself, uh, Mark Aiken, who came out of the CCA Electronics from the drafting, drafting engineering area. Um, a gentleman named Paul Balin, uh, Bill Yorns, and himself. And there were, there, were, there were the five of us, four or five of us working in this company. And it was, uh, it was fun. It was interesting. It was uh, there was there was always something to do. There was never any one job when you have that that small. 1978. My father, who knew some interesting people in the broadcast world, uh, commits David Smith, who was at that time worked in the transmitter. He was a, his father, Julian Smith, started WBFF, Baltimore 45. It was this frequency because they always used, they always had something to do with the call letters that they could do with it. And Sinclair did that because it was Baltimore 45. The next station they built was, I think, Pittsburgh 22 WPTT. Um, but anyway, David was very interested in working with my dad. And they started a separate company called Comar Communications. So we were running two companies out of the same facility. And it was about that time we sold the first transmitter system. We also had brought in Leroy Wallace. So there were three principal partners in Comark Communications and a bunch of smaller partners in Comark Industries, of which I was one, Mark Aiken and Bill Yorns, and my father was the only one that had interest in both. Um, we eventually merged those two companies. I think it was in somewhere around 1982 when we merged the two companies. I think yeah, even after 30 years, 45 years, you're not sure you cover them all, or could have without having good people work around you. And one of the things I think that Comark did better than almost anybody else, I'd like to think, was that we made a home and kept people here for long periods of time and developed great relationships with customers and vendors. And I saw that when my father passed away, how many different groups would come up and 
donate money to my father's scholarship fund for the to promote local engineering at the, the local high schools. It was a great event. WWLP here in Springfield, Mass., was one of the first UHF television stations on the air in the U.S. back in 1953. How did this help shape RF in the New England region? By the time 78 rolled around, we had gotten and developed a good relationship with uh, John Fergie, who was the Director of Engineering for Channel 22. And John was looking for a transmitter system for KSTU Channel 20 out in Salt Lake City. And John asked us if we were interested in building the RF system. My father said, well, you know, CCA Electronics is right here. and We can build some, or get some cabinets from CCA Electronics out of stock because at this particular point, CCA had gone bankrupt. Um, we got the cabinets from CCA. We bought some power supplies from Electro Engineering Works out in San Leandro, California. Um, we got some heat exchangers from Wesley House. We bought some AK breakers from GE. And we went about assembling this whole transmitter system and we sold it. And that one sale was worth more than a whole year's worth of sales for Comark Industries. And we said, this might be an interesting business to get into. We hope you enjoyed this interview with Dick Fury. Please like, share, and subscribe for future videos. And thank Comark and CDS for all things digital TV, MPEG test, and encoding related. Thanks for watching.